Hey everyone, welcome to Great Lakes Church. My name is Carson, and I gotta tell you before we get into our weekly message that we're a community of people helping people find and follow Jesus. We're based out of Southeast Wisconsin. We have physical locations in Kenosha, Racine, but if you're listening to this or watching this, you've found our online presence. We share content on our YouTube and our podcast platforms wherever you listen, and we love that you're a part. If you want to know more about what's going on here at Great Lakes Church, you can find out more at greatlakeschurch.com or check out our central hub. But until then, everything you need is going to be in the description. So enjoy the message and we'll catch you next time. Now, have you ever had someone in your life that was difficult to lead or to get along with? I was thinking this past week about that question, and a guy that I'm just going to call Gary came to my mind. I met Gary when I was on staff at a church in another part of the country. He was a very challenging person to get along with. Large personality and lots and lots and lots of strong opinions. And the church I was at was meeting in a middle school, uh, which was a little problematic because we were growing exponentially. And you know this about middle schools. There's not a lot of room to park. And so we started asking our members, would you please park off site? We had uh, one parking lot that if you parked there, we actually had a shuttle that would bring you to our building. Uh, We said, if you don't want to do that, can you at least utilize the on-street parking? Please, 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 if you are a member of this church, you believe in our mission uh, of just making it easy for people to connect with God, will you please just leave the closest spots for our guests? Well, Gary did not want to be asked to do anything. So he did not cooperate every single week as I'd be standing out, saying hi to people, meeting people. I'd see Gary pull up with his car, take one of the closest spots available. And I would walk out and say, Gary, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to make space for people. So could you please park in the streets? And he would just never do it. Now I know to some of you, I'm going to sound like a jerk, but eventually I asked Gary to leave the church. Now, I was in my mid-20s, so just give me a little bit of break here, right? I I don't know if I'd do that today, but I just said to him, I said, dude, you don't get it. You don't get what our mission is. He's a longtime follower of Jesus, and he just had this attitude and arrogance that I did not want to get into the DNA or the culture of our church. Very tough guy to lead, very tough guy to deal with. Now, all of us have someone like that in our lives, right? Maybe it's someone at work who always plays the devil's advocate. Maybe it's a person in the neighborhood who just makes everything difficult for everybody. Maybe it's a family member with low emotional intelligence or self-awareness, and they just seem to make everything troublesome, right? Maybe it is a friend who you hang out with, and they're a good person, but they never take into consideration what you want to do, and they're just kind of dogmatic and take charge, and this is what we're going to do. This is what we're hanging out. This is what we're going out to eat. Uh, Maybe it's a teenager in your house who it doesn't matter what the rule is or what the request is. They just are in a season of defiance. They're going to live in opposition to what you ask. My guess is if we just pause, all of us at some point could go back in the archives of our mind and we can think of someone who they were just difficult in dealing with, trying to get along with, or trying to lead. And whoever that person is, like whatever face comes to your mind, I want you to know that they are actually not the most difficult person you will ever deal with. The most difficult, the most defiant, the most obstinate, the most rebellious person you are ever going to deal with is yourself. Yeah. Guys, leading Gary was a cakewalk compared to what it has been trying to lead myself for the past 47 years I've been on this planet. Now, last week, or a few weeks ago now, we launched a series called Whack-A-Mole right? And whack-a-mole, of course, is an arcade game where moles will pop up at various speeds. Sometimes they'll pop up simultaneously, and the object is to take a mallet and to strike them down, right? It's to take a mallet and to hit them with force. If you don't hit them with enough force or you don't hit them fast enough, they, uh, you, you are not going to score. And so in this series, what we're doing is we're looking at moles. We're looking at some of the issues in life that just seem to pop up over and over and over, which if we don't strike down, they have the potential to wreak havoc and cause destruction in our lives. Now, I'm intentionally using the word strike down because these are not things we're going to destroy. These are not things that we're going to fully eliminate. This isn't like we're going to have full victory over the battle once and for all. These are things that we'll strike down for a season, but I'm telling you, they will pop back up. And if we do not notice them and strike them down, they will wreak havoc in our lives. So we have to keep them at bay. 
the disciple Peter, he alludes to this in one of his first century letters. He writes this. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The reason we have to be alert is because the devil or Satan does not work in obvious ways. The reason we have to stay alert is because the moles of life, the enemies of life, the difficulties of life, the ongoing challenges of life, they're not always obvious. Most of the time, they're very subtle. And so either A, we don't see them, we don't even notice them, or B, if we do see them, we downplay them. We don't perceive them to be a threat. We, we just kind of ignore them. The problem is, if we ignore them, they still will find a way to make their way into our thinking, into our attitudes, and into our worldview. And I'm telling you, they're going to cause destruction. So two weeks ago, we talked about the importance of learning to identify and strike down those things that cause us to become disillusioned, distrustful, and critical of the world around us. Otherwise, they will lead to cynicism. <laughs> then last week, we talked about learning to identify and strike down those things that try to attack our time and our energy and our resources. Otherwise, it will lead to burnout. And today, what I want to do is talk about learning to identify and strike down those things that try to attack our character. Otherwise, it will lead to unnecessary loss in our life. Now, the key word here is unnecessary. There's a lot of loss in life that's unavoidable. We do not need to complicate our lives by adding unnecessary loss. But if we do not protect our character, if we are not careful morally and ethically in the decisions we're making, I assure you, we will experience unnecessary loss. Loss of respect, loss of influence, loss of a reputation, loss of opportunities, possibly the loss of a marriage or the loss of a friendship, loss of a job, loss of position, loss of self-esteem, loss of confidence. If we do not protect our character, I'm telling you, it's going to result in unnecessary loss. So there's a tiny Welsh village by the name of Abervan which is located in South Wales. Now, in the late 1800s, uh, a mine was opened up in Abervan, and for almost 100 years, what would happen is the coal from this mine, uh, or the debris from the coal, and some of the waste from the coal, uh, would be lifted up in huge bins, and then carted by these overhead uh, cables to an area right outside the village. And so outside the village, there was this growing pile of debris and coal waste uh, on top of a hillside. And as it piled up, it actually created what looked like a mountain, right? There were a couple of different peaks uh, that were created. And just for visitors, people coming in from the outside, they just assumed it's part of the natural landscape. It's more than 100 feet high. Well, in the fall of 1966, the village experienced an unusual amount of heavy rain, uh, turning this mountain of coal debris into a giant sponge. And then on October 21st, 1966, as the town people are going about their lives, right? They're going to their jobs and doing their regular activities. The, the tip of these debris uh, started to slip. What happened is the heavy rain had turned 2 million tons of coal and rock and mud into a liquid of sorts that just started flowing like a river at more than 80 miles an hour down a mountainside into the valley. And so within a matter of seconds, the village of Aravon was transformed into a living nightmare. The village school, along with a cluster of homes, absolutely crushed. More than 144 people ended up losing their lives, most of them were school children. Aravon was completely, you know, for the most part, wiped out, all because of this mountain of debris that really wasn't a true mountain. Now, you just think about this, right? For almost 100 years, the people of Aravon are building a community. They're building homes and making schools. And, and this giant coal mountain outside of their village that just kind of sat in the background, it was a symbol to everyone's hard work. It just kept piling up over and over and over. And then in the course of one day, all of it changed. Now, you and I know it really didn't change in the course of one day. It was decade after decade of de after decade of debris piling up that caused this incredible tragedy. And the reason I tell you this story is because one of the things that I am confident we have all had a front row seat to 
is watching someone's life end up in crisis or disaster. Marriage crisis, health crisis, financial crisis, right? There's a crisis in the career. There's a legal crisis. There's a personal crisis of some sort. And from the outside looking in, it feels like and looks like it just happened overnight. And so it's like, what just happened? Well, one of the things life has taught us is that it didn't just happen. That often it was a very long time in the making. And it's not like we have one example or two examples or three examples of people screwing up their lives and experiencing a disaster or crisis. Come on, we have hundreds of examples that we could give of where people just messed up their lives and we could add ourselves into the equation. So, why is it so common for people to mess up their lives? Every single day, come on, every day on social media, every single day in the news, we come across the name of some politician or some religious leader or some CEO or some athlete who spent their entire life getting to a place of power and influence and then they lose it all because of some moral or ethical risk that they took. Incredibly gifted, incredibly talented individuals. And whenever something like that happens, it drives us nuts because we think, dear God, if I was married to her, that would never have happened. I'd never have been unfaithful. If I'd been in that kind of position of power and influence, I'd have been way more careful. If I'd sold that many albums, if I'd been in that many movies, if I made that much money, if I had that much talent, come on, I would have been way more cautious. Why did they risk what they risked for something they did not really need? Well, the answer is simple. It's because every single day, you and I live in a world that pressures us in the area of achievement and accomplishments. What are your goals? Where are you gonna go to college? What does your portfolio look like? How many people do you have following you on social media? Who are you connected to? Every day, we've got people pressuring us in regards to our achievements and accomplishments, but nobody is pressuring us in regards to who we are on the inside. And so one of the phrases that we've adopted around here, and it's a mantra that we go back to from time to time, is that it's always a mistake to decide what you want to do with your life before you first determine who you want to be. Most of us from a young age, we knew who we wanted to be. Well, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a basketball player, a teacher. I, I, I want to be a nurse. I, I, I want to do something with my life. And then we start growing and maturing and we have these goals of what we want to achieve and accomplish and accumulate. All of that is great. We need to be dreamers. We, we need to have ambition and goals. But one of the things that life has taught us is it's always a mistake to decide what we want to, what we want to do with our life before we first determine who we want to be. And the reason it's a mistake is because our talents and our passions and our drive and our intelligence and the opportunities that come our way have the potential to make us very, very successful. And at the same time, they also have the potential to carry us way past what our character can sustain. And that's why before we decide what we're going to do with our life, before we decide what we're going to achieve and accomplish and accumulate, we must first decide who we want to be. Because who we want to be and who we are on the inside, that matters. So Moses was uh, the well-loved leader of the Jewish people. We talk about Moses a lot here at Great Lakes Church. And Moses led the Jewish people for 40 years and multiple seasons of his leadership, uh, he was facing burnout, right? He was just overwhelmed. And on one occasion, his father-in-law, Jethro, uh, sees the way Moses is just burning out and he confronts him about it. And he says, Moses, I, I see you spending your entire days meeting with people, trying to settle disputes. You're overwhelmed, you're angry, you're overly emotional. And I'm telling you, I, I, just looking at your life is spiraling out of control. You need to fix it. And then his father-in-law gives him some unsolicited advice. He says, the way you can fix it is just surround yourself with some people who can help. And here's what he told Moses. He says, select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. So here's Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and he says, choose people. And he doesn't say, and here's the deal, go have him fill out Myers-Briggs personality profile because this is the profile you want. He doesn't say, have him fill out an Enneagram because if you could get this type of Enneagram number, that, that's the right person for the job. No, he says, here are the qualifi qualifications you need uh, for, for people who are helping you. They need to be capable. They need to be honest. They need to have a reverence for God and they need to hate bribes. 
They need to be capable. That speaks to competency. They need to have talent uh, and giftings in, in, in working with people. That's the first one. But the other three all have to do with character. They're honest. They have a respect for God. They hate bribes. All throughout the scriptures, there is an emphasis placed on character. 3,000 years ago, King Solomon of Israel, he writes that people with integrity walk safely. But those who follow cricket paths will be exposed. You have integrity, you're walking safely, but if you follow crooked paths, you're going to be exposed. If, you, if you're careless in the way you walk morally, if you're careless in the way you walk ethically, if you're careless in the way you do relationships, eventually you're going to be exposed. You're not going to be exposed overnight. It's going to take some time. Who we are on the inside, it doesn't show up immediately, right? It doesn't necessarily show up this week or this month or even this year, but I'm telling you, eventually who we are on the inside will show up. It shows up in our relationships. It shows up in our conversations. It shows up in our business transactions. It shows up in our marriages and our parenting. It shows up in every area of our life. So let me ask you very directly, who do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? Now, I've had some time to think about it, but I'm telling you, I would have given you the same answer 15 years ago and 20 years ago as I will today. I just want to be the same person in every environment I'm in. That's it. Yes, I want to be a person of character, but I want to be the same person when I'm by myself as I am with my family, as I am when I'm just with my wife, Rindy, as I am when I'm with people from the church, as I am with people who are my neighbors. I just want to be the same person in every environment. I've said this before, that if I were to define success for my life, success for me is that the people who know me best love and respect me the most. I don't always do a great job of it, Certainly, I, 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 I get it wrong. But I'm constantly working that the people who know me best love and respect me the most. So who do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? And however you answer that question, assuming it has something related to being a person of good character, you need to be on guard. And the reason why is because the moles of this life are just going to pop up over and over and over, and they're going to slowly cause destruction if you're not striking them down. So, so what are some of the moles that destroy our character? What are the moles working against us? Let's just go through this list, right? One of the moles working against our character is inconsistency. This is when we make promises that we don't follow through on. This is when we start saying things we don't really believe. This is when we sign up to attend an event or to bring something to a party, but nobody relies on us anymore because they just know we're not dependable. It doesn't seem like inconsistency is that big of a deal. So what? I dropped the ball. But I'm telling you, over time, inconsistency, it erodes our character and it puts us up in a very vulnerable position. Another mole that is working against our character is blame. This is when things go south in our life and we just point our finger and we blame everybody and their mother for why things are go do going the way they're going. Right? We don't take any real responsibility for our actions. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal, so I blamed the government. I blamed my family. I blamed my mom. I blamed my dad. I blamed my wife. I blamed my husband. I blamed my kids. I blamed my employer. I blamed my employees. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but I'm telling you, over time, what blame does is erodes our character. Excuses, right? We tell little white lies. We don't control our temper. We're unkind. We gossip. And when we're confronted, we, we just excuse ourselves. Well, this is what everybody does. Everybody cheats a little bit on their taxes. Everybody exaggerates. Everybody tells little white lies. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal, so we make excuses, but I'm telling you, over time, excuses erode uh, our character. Another mole that works to destroy us is apathy. Apathy is when we just kind of sit back and let life happen, right? We are reactive rather than proactive. So we don't pay much attention to people we're hanging out with. We don't pay much attention to the media we're consuming, to the influences we're allowing in our life. We're just kind of passive, just let life unfold. Now, obviously, I'm not going to advocate that we live with paranoia, right? Now, we're just constantly, oh, what, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing there? I am saying that we need to be vigilant and pay attention to what makes its way into our minds and into our hearts. And the reason why is because what makes its way into our minds and into our hearts will shape our worldview. This is why the Apostle Paul, he writes to first century followers of Jesus, 
And he challenges them. He says, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith, be courageous, and be strong. Why do we need to be on guard? Because every good thing in this life has a potential downside. And if we are not paying attention, the good things in this life will turn on us and start causing destruction. All right, so think of fire, right? One of the greatest inventions of all time. Keeps people warm, allows food to be cooked, it provides light when it's dark outside. Fire allows people to gather together and build community with each other. But used in the wrong way, fire can also torture people. It can hurt people. It can be used to destroy homes and to destroy possessions. And if you experience the house fire, you know that firsthand. Every good thing in this life has a potential downside. Technology, friendships, sex, money, power. And because every good thing has a potential downside, we cannot afford to live with an apathetic approach to life. We cannot be indifferent about what we're listening to, what we're watching, or who we are hanging out with. Because otherwise, the moles of this life start to erode our character. Another mole that's working against us is compromise. A compromise is when we shift our beliefs or our values based on who we're around or whatever situation we're in. So anytime that we lie, anytime we manipulate, what we're doing is we're compromising the truth. Anytime we take advantage of another person in some way, anytime we participate in something where there is a conflict of interest, we're compromising our ethics. Anytime that we're secretive about something, right? We have secret accounts, we have secret conversations, uh, we're erasing our browser history, we're, we're compromising in those moments, we're compromising our integrity. Anytime that we act like we're in agreement with something that we're really not, we're compromising our beliefs. Anytime we start opening up emotionally to someone of the opposite sex, someone we're not married to, anytime we're spending excessive amounts of time with them, what we're doing is we're compromising morally. And the reason that compromise is so destructive to our character is because whenever we compromise our values or our beliefs or our ethics or our morals, what it does is it makes it obvious to ourselves and to others that we can't be trusted to do what's right. And so what compromise does is it slowly eats away at our character. Just one more example of a mole that would destroy our character is hypocrisy. Right? This is when our exterior image and our interior image does not match up. It's when we have expectations of others that we don't have for ourselves. And the problem with hypocrisy is it creates this growing gap between our public life and our private life. And there's a lot of danger when that occurs. And so 2,000 years ago, Jesus is talking to a group of religious leaders and he's giving them a lecture about this. He actually calls them hypocrites and then he explains with a metaphor on why he called them that. He says, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. It's a great picture. He looks at these religious leaders and said, man, you're great at keeping up outward appearance. To everybody around you, you look like you're loving and kind and compassionate. You look very, very religious, like you are deeply in love with God. You're, you're, you look generous. But he says, inside, you're really not like that. Inside, you, you are, you're greedy. You're self-indulgent. If we are not paying attention, there will slowly be this growing gap between our words and our actions, between what we say and how we live. And so what I'm trying to do by giving you all these examples is to help you understand that there are constantly moles that are popping up in life that if we're not striking them down, they're going to be eroding, they're going to be eating away at our character. So we have to pay attention. 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul, he's writing a letter to first century followers of Jesus living in Ephesus, and he cautions them to stay away from things that will hurt their character. Stay away from these things that are going to cause you to become greedy or sexually immoral or, or hurt other people. And after giving some words of caution, here's what Paul writes. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Don't be careless. Don't be a fool. Pay attention to how you're living our life. Our character is being attacked every single day. And if we are not careful, we're going to be inconsistent or we're going to begin blaming others for our actions, or we're going to be making excuses all the time, or we're going to become very apathetic towards things in life, or we're going to 
uh, constantly be compromising in key areas of life or we're gonna become hypocritical and ultimately we'll find ourselves in a position where the people who know us best love and respect us the least. And none of us want that. I don't think I've ever met a person who had a plan on how to mess up their life. Right? No one ever stood at an altar and exchanged vows with someone and thought, I can't wait to get married because I wanna screw this thing up. Right? Nobody ever had kids and thought, this for me is a scientific experiment. Right? I want to make a bunch of empty promises to my kids and see how long it takes to put them into counseling. Nobody plans to mess up their lives, but very few people plan not to mess up their lives either. And so I want to wrap up today by giving you a three-fold plan on how not to mess up your life. But before I do that, I'm going to warn you. The plan I'm going to give you is going to require you to be a maverick. It's going to require you to be an outlier. It's going to require you to swim against the current of culture. You're going to have to choose a different path than almost everyone around you is taking, and it's not going to be easy. So how to not mess up your life? Number one, take responsibility for your life. Because every time we blame someone for our choices or for the consequences of our decisions, what happens is it erodes our character. Every time we make excuses for, excuses for why we're unkind or why we said what we said or did what we did, it erodes our character. And if you want to protect your character and ensure you don't mess up your life, you have to take responsibility for your life. And it's hard to do because we live in a culture where everybody blames everybody, right? The reason I'm not growing spiritually is it's the pastor's fault. It's the church's fault. It's the fault of the music team. They're not deep enough for me. They're not singing songs that resonate with me. The reason my financial life is a mess is this economy sucks. My boss doesn't pay me what I'm worth. The reason our country has fallen apart is because of the irresponsible Republicans or the irresponsible Democrats. The reason I'm angry all the time, the reason I don't control my emotions is because of who I'm married to or because of the people I have to work with or because of the stress I'm carrying every single day. If you don't want to mess up your life, you have to take responsibility for your life. The second thing you need to do, and it's going to be swimming against the current of culture, is you need to learn how to establish boundaries in your life. Our culture is not going to teach us to set up boundaries, right? Our culture is really good about helping us set up guidelines and rules of thumb. For example, our culture will say, drink responsibly. We don't even really know what that means. Right? Does that mean I have a slight buzz? Does that mean I'm a 0.04? Does that, what does that mean to drink responsibly, right? Boundaries are much more clear than that. Or how about this one? Tell teenagers, wait until you're ready to have sex. Not a bad guideline, but every single teenage boy that I know will say, dude, I was born ready. <laughs> the guideline. Or how about when you go to buy some things, right? This is a great time to buy because 0% financing for six months. It's a guideline. Right? Or maybe you've heard this at some point in your life. Just listen to your heart. What is your heart telling you what to do? Follow your heart. Worst advice you could give anybody. Jewish prophet Jeremiah, he wrote about our heart. And here's what he said. He said, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? We have to take responsibility for our life. And one of the most practical ways we do that is by establishing boundaries. Boundaries for what I watch, boundaries for what I listen to, boundaries for what I allow and permit in my life, boundaries for what I participate in, boundaries for who I hang out with. And nobody's gonna do that for me. I gotta do it for myself. Culture does not encourage or celebrate boundaries. And yet, they are very fast to shame us and mock us when we end up going too far in any direction. Think about this. Right? Culture baits us to the edge of disaster and then mocks us when we step over. Baits us to the edge of disaster. You do whatever you want to do. You say whatever you want to say. You sleep with whoever you want to sleep with. You go wherever you want to go. Come on, it is your life. Don't let people tell you what to do. You do you. And then culture shames and mocks us when we end up ruining our lives. Well, you, you shouldn't have told that joke. You shouldn't have slept with that person. You shouldn't have gone to that establishment. What were you thinking? How could you have been so dumb? How could you have been so naive? And let me just give you an example from modern culture, right? For decades, the great preacher, Billy Graham, had a rule that he would not ride alone in a car with a woman who was not his wife. He said, I would not eat lunch alone with a woman who is not my wife. I will not meet privately alone with a woman who is not my wife. And it became known as the Billy Graham rule. Now, in 2019, there was a politician by the name of Robert uh, Foster who was running for governor of Mississippi, all right? 
And during this time of running for governor, it was discovered that Robert was incredibly cautious, some would argue overly cautious, when he was spending time with people, oh, with, with, with women, with you know, uh, the opposite sex. And so he was asked about it, and he explained in a tweet that he personally followed what was known as the Billy Graham rule. He didn't suggest that other people follow it. He didn't say, this is what I expect of everyone working for me. He says, I personally follow the Billy Graham rule. As a result of that tweet and that explanation, the LA Times ran an editorial titled, Following the Billy Graham Rule Doesn't Make You Noble, It Makes You a Sexist Dinosaur. I read the article, and it just blasted this guy for being so outdated in his thinking. Culture baits us to the edge of disaster and then mocks us when we step over. The very individuals who mock someone for a self-imposed standard, I promise you, will be the exact same ones to jump in and write a story if there's a scandal that unfolds. So we need self-imposed boundaries. And it's a challenge because nobody's going to encourage us to do it. And boundaries are not established by asking, can I do it? They're established by asking, should I do it? Should I do it is a very important question because every good thing in this life has a potential downside. One more thing we need to do if we want to uh, ensure that we don't mess up our lives is determine that we're going to live like an open book. Now, for someone like me who's more outgoing and kind of processes in a verbal way, that's not going to be as challenging as maybe it is for some of you. But this is where we just say, as best I can, I'm going to let people see the good, bad, and ugly in my life. Because when we live with secrets, when there is a sin, when there is evil, when there's wrongdoing, when there's something just not right inside of us, if it's not exposed, it has the opportunity to grow. The only way for it to stop growing is usually for it to be exposed to the light. In one of his first century letters to followers of Jesus, living in Ephesus, the apostle Paul, he alludes to this. He says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. We have a phrase that we use at Great Lakes Church that we say we try, do our best to operate with uh, lights on and windows open. Just kind of this phrase like, dude, at, at any point uh, that we're asked questions, we try to be as honest as we can about it. We don't try to hide anything. Like we just live as an open book. What are you doing in this situation? What are you guys trying to do over here? We just, we, we just try to honest, as, as, as respectfully and, and, and as honestly as, as we possibly can. And it doesn't come natural for a lot of people, right? So it has to be intentional. And I warned you uh, earlier that when you choose to live like this, it's exhausting. Right? Living your life like an open book, you have to swim against the flow of culture. Now, in some ways, it's very freeing because you don't have to wonder, who am I in this environment versus this environment versus this environment? But nobody's going to be standing around cheering you on. So I'll end with this, right? Here's a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. 1.7 miles long, painted with a color known as vermilion orange. And what almost none of us think about if we're looking at the bridge or driving across it is all of the maintenance that's required to keep a bridge like this looking good and, and, and making sure it's safe. Right, so you'd think a bridge like this is painted maybe once a year or maybe it's every few years. But in reality, the Golden Gate Bridge is constantly being painted. Matter of fact, there is a team of almost 30 people who you never see, you never notice, but they're always painting the bridge. And the reason why is because there's such high uh, salt content in the air, right? And obviously there's water surrounding the bridge at all times that it causes rust and corrosion. And if there is a part of the bridge that's unsealed with paint, it's going to corrode the steel. And it has the possibility of leading to structural damage. And it can ultimately lead to disaster. And so there's always people painting the bridge. Nobody notices, nobody applauds, nobody says thank you. It's just a monotonous job. And that's what it's like taking care of our hearts and protecting our character. It requires us to work on ourselves day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month. Nobody notices, nobody's cheering us on, nobody's thanking us. But if we stop paying attention to our character, we slowly start making decisions that lead to disaster, I'm telling you, at some point, everybody's gonna know. That's the stuff that makes the news. The hardest person to lead is you. The hardest person for me to lead is me. But I'm telling you, if we can do it, there's a great payoff in the end. Why? Because Solomon wrote, people with integrity walk safely. And if you walk with integrity, you will not have to experience unnecessary loss in your life. There's a whole lot of unavoidable loss. So let's not complicate it with unnecessary loss. 
because of our inattention to character. Now, if you messed up, if you complicated your life, if you say, man, I've already gone too far, let me just tell you, there's hope, right? As followers of Jesus, we have to always understand there is a hopeful future in front of us. You've screwed up, God restores. When everybody else sees death, we see life. We see a resurrection. When everybody else sees a mess, we see what God is able to do with that mess. And so don't lose hope. Just determine today is a new day. I'm gonna start moving in a different direction. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the goodness, the grace, and the kindness of God. All of us have stories of how we've messed up our lives, of how we've screwed up, how we've done things that we shouldn't have done. And we thank you that you are a God who redeems and restores. I pray, help us as we determine to live lives that move down a path uh, that we're proud of. May all of us be people who care about our character and live our lives in a way that honors you. And may the people who know us best love and respect us the most. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us here at Great Lakes Church. Again, my name is Carson, and I'm so glad that you chose to share some time with us this week. We hope something in this talk was meaningful to you, encouraging to you, and maybe even something worth writing down that you can go share with a friend. If you'd like to get involved, maybe join us at one of our physical locations in Southeast Wisconsin, or just be a part of our many other goings on on our social platforms or events in the area, check out greatlakeschurch.com.